All right, the title of the sermon this morning is The Power of Consistency. The Power of Consistency. You know, in our life, um, if you were to think about it, uh, you know, it's not often that, you know, you may do some huge action that is a life-changing thing. You know, the reality of our lives is um, it is a daily series of mundane events. Um, and this is why the, the daily change that you do or the daily actions that you put in, that is ultimately what leads to larger changes in your life. And, you know, if you set those things in motion, like those daily little tasks and that daily consistency, that's when you can look back on your life, you know, five years from now, 10 years from now, and you may not recognize the person that you have, you know, the person that you are now, you may not recognize the person that you once were. But some people think that these changes happen, you know, in leaps and bounds. But but what I want to what I want to sort of you to reflect on today is the power of consistency. Just the small things that you do daily, and you have to make those decisions now, make the small changes, and that usually is what happens in order to lead to larger changes. So I want to show you this theme of this faithful consistency that really is how the Christian life is. You know, and some people think, well, I'm not ready to do this big thing or that big thing. That's not how it works. I mean, even when you look at me today, you say, Victor, you know, why do you seem so confident? Or why do you seem like, you know, so easy for you to have these conversations and all these sorts of things? And, and even when you, you know, maybe, uh, you know, you're the type that you know, thinks, oh, you know, I'm so, uh, you know, uh, so scared of public speaking. I, I was at that point too one day, you know, like there was a point, you know, when, when like I started going to church and there was a point when I started reading the Bible and there was a point where I first went soul winning and there was that time when I was completely, you know, nerve, you know, completely nervous, you know, trying to, you know, speak to a to to an audience the first time and the first time I went soul winning and the first time I went from being a silent partner to preaching the gospel and it but then you know I look at myself today and maybe you will look at me today and you know and maybe people that have known me in the past like obviously I've changed but was it just this one day I just woke up and I was a different person or just in a year's time it was a different person no it was the daily consistent faithfulness of just trying to do right and the ups and the downs of the Christian life but like I say to a lot of you you know but you're just slowly trending upwards you know but you have to have that consistency you know in your Christian life to just continue to plod along and that's how things change in your life and uh, this is why we're starting here in 2 Timothy 4 where we see the, the faithfulness of Paul. And um, I only had verses 1 to 8, but as I was reading through that, man, I just wanted to point out a few other things as, as I read through that. That uh, not only did he talk about, you know, and, and tried to encourage from his own faithfulness others to be faithful in the ministry and, and to be instant in season, out of season, when things are popular, when things are not popular. Um, what I realized just reading through this this morning as well uh, that I, I they didn't plan to put in this sermon is, is also the people that went, did it with him and all the, also the people that forsook him in his journey in his Christian life. So I just wanted to show that here as we talk through it. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Right? So this is what he's trying to tell to Timothy. Right? He's trying to say to Timothy, you continue to be faithful in preaching God's word it be instant, so that's very related to the word consistent, right? Be instant, in season, out of season. So what is he talking to here? He's saying when something's in season, it's when it's popular. It's when everyone wants to hear it, you know? But then when, when it's not popular and nobody wants to hear it anymore, he's saying don't stop preaching the word. Be faithful and consistent, con continually preaching God's word. In season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. He's saying, Timothy, the time's going to come when what you are preaching is not going to be popular, right? But then right now it might be popular, but the time will come when it's not popular, when they just want to hear things that tickle their ears, that, you know, that excite them, that are interesting to them, even though what you're preaching is important. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, right? Make full proof of thy ministry. So not only 
Do we in season, out of season, preach the gospel, but in season, out of season, we continue to do the work of an evangelist, the work of the ministry. Right? Make full proof of thy ministry. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. You know, this is like Paul is such a good example to us, how he was faithful. He could say these things. You know, I want to be able to say this at the end of my life, that I fought a good fight. I have finished my course. You know, a lot of people can only say, I started my course. You know, but can you, don't you want to say in your Christian life that I finished my course? You know, I've kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness with the Lord. The righteous judge shall give me. So obviously there are eternal rewards for serving the Lord. And not to me only. So this is not a privilege that was only reserved for apostles and those in the early church and to people like Paul. But he says, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Isn't that interesting that he ties in the faithfulness to God's commandments and to God's ministry with love? Because ultimately that's what it comes down to. You know, like when we think about, you know, are we going to continue to live our Christian life as we are, even in the times we live today? Doesn't, isn't that what it boils down to? Is what do you love more, right? Do you love the world more? Do you love your, your career and your job and your business more? Or do you love the Lord more? That's what it comes down to. That love is appearing. Why is that? Because when we love God and we want to keep His commandments and we love God, why? We're having that eternal perspective that the rewards we're going to get in heaven is way more valuable than anything that we can gain here by not keeping His commandments, right? Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. So verse 8 is where I had planned to just share to. But then I was reading it this morning. I was like, wow, like you can see this theme here that Paul is talking to Timothy to say, be faithful like I have been faithful unto the end. And here's some examples of, unfortunately, people that fell short of this goal. For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. Isn't that interesting how it ties together about our faithfulness to God and loving this present world. And it's departed unto Thessalonica. Now, if you're, uh, so everyone talks about Demas, right? When people talk about people getting out of church, it's like, you know, there's like Demas. This is where it comes from. And it's departed unto Thessalonica. Crescens to Galatia. Look at this. Titus unto Dalmatia. Now, you know, the pastoral epistles is uh, Timothy and Titus. So you can see here that Titus had forsaken Paul at one point and left like, you know, Crescens and Demas. Only Luke is with me, right? Luke, the one that wrote the Gospel of Luke and um, the book of Acts. Take Mark and bring him with me, for he is profitable to me to the ministry. Now, what's interesting about Mark is there was a time when Mark forsook Paul. So we can see here that it's just because people have done wrong in the past, it's not too late for them either to come back doing the right thing. And Mark is a great example of that where, you know, later on in Paul's life, Mark came back and he's saying about Mark, hey, he's profitable to me for the ministry. That's a great thing as well. You know, when people get out of church or they, they're not as faithful serving, but then they get renewed again and they get back to serving the Lord as they ought. Tychicus have I sent to Ephesus, the cloak that I left at Troas with Carpus, when they'll come, bring with thee and the books, but especially the parchments. I'll just leave it there, but I just thought it was interesting that he mentions some names there as well. So the power of consistency, right? The power of consistency. Remember, you know, when we think about making big changes, even in the world, in anything, in your business, in your work, in your Christian life, these things take time. So it's, it's not just about, um, you know, reminding you of this truth this morning about consistency, but it's also encouraging you that if you're not necessarily seeing the changes in your life or changes in things as quickly as you want, you know, don't lose heart, right? Because change often takes, you know, time and this consistency. But if you're consistent, then those changes will be inevitable. The power of consistency, right? Let's talk about a couple of things. So one is just, let's just talk about our spiritual growth our spiritual growth. And, and let's think about the, the different aspects of the Christian life and how consistency, we can see consistency is required for all these things, right? 
Look at James 5, 7. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he receive the early and latter rain. So we see here that when we just talk about the physical example of just bringing forth fruit, of just gardening or planting crop and waiting for it to grow. Look, it doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen, it doesn't happen in a month. Like it, it takes time to prepare the soil and the consistency of the farmer to make sure that he's always looking after it, getting rid of the weeds, pruning, doing whatever. And then after a long time of patience and endurance and consistency, right, that fruit is brought forth. Well, God uses that analogy of, you know, this husbandman trying to bring forth fruit in his vineyard uh, amongst the vine to the Christian life too. Right? So when we think about bearing fruit in our life, this is not something that happens quickly. This is something that has to happen through the consistent growing and learning and of your spiritual growth. I am the true vine. My father is the husbandman. Right? So isn't that interesting that you know, we think in James 5, I mean, God is patient with us to bring forth this fruit. My father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Right Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him. The same. Right, right. Same bringeth forth much fruit. I was like, saying, I'm, hearing, I'm hearing an echo in here. <laughs> For without me, ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, she asks what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be, my disciples. So what is the Christian life like, right? The Christian life, is something wrong? All right, so where was I? Talking about spiritual growth being a, uh, a consistent thing, right? Because if we think about us being fruitful in our Christian life, just like we are branches on this vine, the father is the husbandman, as we bring forth fruit, you need to realize that this is going to require consistency, right? This slow, patient consistency to bring forth this fruit. Look at Luke 9. Luke 9, verse 23. And he said to them all, if any man will come after me, look at this, let him deny himself, look at this, and take up his cross daily and follow me. Whosoever will lose his life, whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. Right, so again, it's not these just huge leaps and bounds normally that happens in your Christian life. See, it's the, the taking up of the cross daily. You see that consistency in your Christian life? That's where the change comes slowly, 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 right? Spiritual, let's have a look at spiritual applications. So we talked about spiritual growth is likened to fruit bringing, being brought forth. Let's, let's think about some spiritual applications, right? Just the things we do in our Christian life. What about learning? Just learning. Look at Isaiah 28 verse 9. Whom shall he teach knowledge and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breasts. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line. Look at this, here a little and there a little, right? For with stammering and, and there a little, for with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to the people. And to whom he said, this is the rest wherewith you may cause the weary to rest and this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. But the word of the Lord was unto them, Precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little, that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken away. So you see how learning the Bible, it's not like you're just going to sit down and then read it once. Some people say like, oh yeah, I've read the Bible once. Yeah, and you've probably forgot everything you've read as well, right? Because why? It's the consistency of little bit, little bit here and there and the consistency of it slowly building up that you then gain that knowledge, 
right? You can gain a lot of knowledge in a long time, but how much do you retain unless you repeat, right? Repetition makes permanent. You know, people, a lot of people say repetition, you know, makes, or practice makes perfect. But a better way to think of that saying, because we'll never be perfect, is practice makes permanent. The more you do it, the more it becomes permanent in your life and you get that consistency, right? And that's why it's the same with church. Why is, is church weekly? Right, and the people that come to church only every now and then they tend to forget a lot of things, right? Because they don't have that consistency of that doctrine, just slowly learning it, they're being reminded again, learning it, being reminded again, and that's what makes it permanent and something that you can remember. Hebrews ten twenty four. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And look at this: the so much the more as you see the day approaching, right? This is why church ought to be consistent, right? It ought to be something that we go to regularly, right? To consider one another and to provoke unto um, love and to good works. So that's just a, an application there spiritually, just about learning God's word, and getting more knowledge and more doctrine in you. Luke 4, and Jesus answered him saying, it is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every Word of God. You know, the Lord's Prayer says, give us this day our daily bread. And yes, it is talking about our physical things that God provides for, for us, but it also applies to the daily physical bread of God's Word. So right, when we think about reading God's Word, it should be something consistent as well that we don't, see, we don't eat once a week, do we? For some people, that's the only Bible they get is once a week, right? Really, when we think about our daily bread, we don't even eat just once a day. Right? People eat like three times a day. I mean, people have morning tea and afternoon tea and then midnight snack and then all these sorts of things. Coffee on the way to work, coffee and biscuit on the way to work. Right? So if that's the way you eat, what is God trying to tell us how our relationship with this word should be like? If man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Look at the instruction given to the king. Now, obviously, God did not want a king for the nation of Israel. And he told them in Deuteronomy 17 that, you know, they're going to reject him and then they're going to choose for themselves a king. But when they say, when you choose for yourself a king, this is what some of the things that the king should do. Right? When thou art come unto the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, and shalt possess it, and shalt dwell therein, and shalt say, I will set a king over me, like as all the nations that are about me. So we see there that, you know, people want to be like people in the world. Rather than doing what God says, doing how God wants it, you know, people look at, other examples in the world and want to be like what they see rather than what God has said in his word. Thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee, whom the Lord thy God shall choose. One from among thy brethren shalt thou set king over thee. Thou mayest not set a stranger over thee, which is not thy brother. I wonder if that's where they get the idea that you, know, you ought to be a citizen to be a, a ruler in a nation. But he shall, so here's some advice to the king, right? What the king should do. But he shall not multiply horses to himself, right? nor cause the people to return to Egypt to the end that he should multiply horses. For as much as the Lord hath said unto you, ye shall henceforth return no more that way. So I don't know if the horses represent like building up a huge army, right? Because why? In these days, they didn't need huge armies and huge you know, forces because the, the nation was the force itself. So it's kind of like saying, you know, and I wonder, you know, it makes me think about, you know, days today where nobody, nobody's armed and then the only ones that have, you know, the military might are those in charge and it, and it just, you know, perpetuates this oppression, right? Because there's already somebody in charge that shouldn't be in charge the way that God had had it and now they've got this military might. It's something to be, be aware of. He shall henceforth return no more that way. Neither shall he multiply wives to himself. So again, see that there was a specific exhortation to the leader of the nation to not have multiple partners, right? Multiple wives to be, to be a monogamous marriage. That his heart turned not away, neither shall he greatly multiply to himself silver and gold, right? And what happens to your politicians these days? They get paid with so much more than your average person, right? But then they should just be making what, you know, like a medium, median wage, if you think about it. And it shall be when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write him a copy of this law. So this is the part I wanted to point out to you. It shall be when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book 
out of that which is before the priests and the Levites. Did you see that? That God wanted the king to write out his own copy of the Bible, right? And it shall be with him, right? So it's not something that he just does and then it sits on a shelf and he never uses it. It shall be with him. And look at this. And he shall read therein all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, to keep all the words of this law and these statutes to do them. Now you say, well, this was only for the king to do, but obviously the king was there to be an example to his kingdom, right? So you see here that we have the Bible, we read therein all the days of his life. What's the effect of that? That he may learn to fear the Lord his God, to keep all the words of this law and these statutes to do them. Look at this, verse 20, that his heart be not lifted up, so you see how the more you know God's word, the more you study God's word, that line upon line, precept upon precept, it doesn't make you more proud. It actually humbles you, right? And that he turned not aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left, right? It keeps him walking, doing the right thing to the end that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. Right? So we see there that learning of God's word, that line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. Luke 18, we see not only the reading of our Bible ought to be something consistent, right? But we see prayer ought to be consistent too. Uh, this is the parable of the unjust judge. He spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Right? So you say, always to pray. You say, well, I am always praying. Yeah, but how consistent are you in your prayers? This is the parable he gives about how he wants us to pray, saying there was a city... There was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city. And she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while. But afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual, right? Think about that word consistency. Continual coming to me. Coming, she weary me. And the Lord said, hear what the unjust judge saith, And shall not God avenge his own elect? Look at this. Which cry day and night unto him. Does that sound like that cries weekly to him? That cries monthly to him? Is that the sort of consistency God is talking about when he talks about prayer? No. Which cry day and night. This is like two times at least a day, though he bear long with them. And I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. Do people believe enough to be like this widow, to petition God day and night for the things that they believe are the will of God? 1 Corinthians 3. So we talked about Bible reading. We talked about church, you know, the consistency in learning. Now we talked about prayer, but also in our soul winning, right? If we, if we apply that analogy of fruit in our own life, requiring time to grow and for fruit to bring forth, how much more as the person that plants and waters requires patience and consistency to bring forth fruit, you know, in their, in, in their work, in their work of, uh, of their ministry. First Corinthians 3, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God giveth the increase. Right? So now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. And every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. So you see how the spiritual life we can see in God's word is not expected to be just like a flash in the pan. Right? It's expected to be a consistent thing. And, and it's a lot easier to do small steps. I mean, even in any goal-setting lesson that you do in life, you know, what do they say? They, you find out what your purposes are, you set your goals, and then you've got to set actions. And if these actions are too big and too unrealistic, likely you're not going to do them. So you need to break them down into the daily activities and the small things that you just do daily, and then eventually you automatically work towards that goal. It's a lot easier to do that than it is to, you know, say, I'm going to sit down and read the whole Bible. Right, it's a lot easier to just daily read a few chapters every day and the power of that consistency means that it's always in your mind and you're slowly learning and before you know it, you're going to know, you know more than most people 
But what was it? It was just the consistency of that learning, that line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. All right. Now let's think about some other practical applications. So there's, those are some spiritual applications. I know to all of them, to an extent, it's a spiritual application. But I just want to show some other things in the Bible as well, some practical applications. One is raising our children, raising our children, right? Proverbs 22 verse 6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. It's interesting that the Bible uses this word train. Because when you train somebody, it's not just you tell them once and then you just expect them to do that. You know, most people, you know, are, are better at training their animals than they are at training their own children, right? And you think, like, somebody gets a dog, they've raised a dog before, and they're happy to take their dog to this, to this lesson every week to tell them how to teach them how to sit and teach them how to lay down and teach them how to fetch a ball and teach them how to roll over. And then they'll spend time with their dog at home and say, sit and, and, and do all these things. But then, yeah, a lot of people don't do the same thing with their children, where that, that consistency of showing them, teaching them, reinforcing it to get that behavior. They just expect children, sometimes they just tell them and they should just do it. No, there's a, there's a training there, just like the same way you would train animals, right? The, the people train animals where they show them and they reinforce it and they practice it and they spend time with them doing that. So like with training our children, that consistency is necessary as well to help teach them the ways of the Lord. And when we see how God expects us to train our children, we see that consistency that is expected of us to impart the knowledge to our children. Deuteronomy 6 verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, Right? So they need to be in your heart because you are consistent with God's word, spending time with God's word, so they're in your heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. So you see how it's a constant daily as you spend time with them that you are teaching your children of the things of God. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. Why? So you want the word of God around the place so that it's consistently in your view. Right? It's always like the king. It's with them, and he reads there in all the days of his life. So this is why God, he wants God's word in your view, in your mind, you considering it so that you'll talk about it consistently as well. Right? You don't want to leave it to others to train your children in the ways of the Lord. You need to do this yourself and you need the, the example and the consistency in your own life. What's another one? What's another one? So not only training up our children requires consistency, and if we know that it requires consistency, then we'll take more effort in doing those daily consistent steps, and that's why our example is important. But really, just mastering anything, if you think about it, 1 Corinthians 9, look what he says here. He says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain. So he's saying well, a lot of people can run in a race, but only one wins. And he's saying you want to run in your spiritual race like you want to win it. Right? Some people, they're just happy to get a participation award. Right? And, and Paul is saying here, that's not what you should be content with, right? You should run that you may obtain that prize as though you're the one person that's going to win. And every man that striveth for the mastery, so anyone that becomes an expert in their skill and their craft is temperate in all things. What does that mean? Discipline. Discipline is consistency, right? And this consistency of setting a task and being consistent and diligent and temperate and disciplined in that thing. And if you know any story of anyone that has been extremely successful in any sport or in any skill, like we don't see the sacrifice that they put aside. You know, the, the daily training and the thought, the things that they give up, right, in order to have this consistent practice so they can be at their best. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. 
Right? So whether it's mastering any skill, like I said in the beginning, practice makes permanent. That's a better way to think of that phrase than practice makes perfect, right? Because you'll never be perfect, so that's like just the wrong expectation. If I keep practicing, eventually I'll be perfect. No, but practice makes permanent. The more you practice something, the more it becomes permanent in your life. And that's the power of consistency, to, to make that change in your life permanent so that you can continue adding little upon little, right? Line upon line, precept upon precept. So that can apply to any skill in your life. But not only to the skills, I mean, think about just in terms of, you know, finances as well, right? When we think about savings, everyone should be putting a little aside. And it's a lot easier to, as your paycheck comes in fortnightly or weekly, that you put a little bit away, put a little bit away, and that consistency, if you understand the power of compounding interest and how investments grow, that little putting away and saving is a lot better than, you know, just not spending any money for like a week and just putting the whole thing away, right? You want that consistency so that you will actually end up doing it. So when it comes to building any habit, you know, I've often heard that if you do something, people throw out a different number of days, but they'll say like, you know, if you do something for 14 days, that's what it takes to build a habit. Or if you do something every day for 30 days, any habit can be built. And that just, again, talks to this power of consistency, like building these good habits. Now, the last thing I want to talk about before we conclude we talked about the power of consistency, right? And just doing consistent things in order to spiritually grow and also just the practical application in our life. But here's the warning, right? That consistency can work both ways, right? Because remember that, that, that repetition and that consistency and that practice becomes permanent. So that can work for you, but that can also work against you. Why? Because if you are consistently, for example, skipping church, that can become permanent, right? You are consistent in skipping your Bible reading. That can become permanent too. And the power of that consistency can work against you. The, the, you know, you're consistently skipping prayer, right? You're not praying. It's so consistently skipping soul winning. That starts to become permanent in your life because that's what you're practicing. You know, you're consistent in your bad example to your children. That becomes permanent in your life. And the power of consistency works against you. What about the, cons the, co the consistency in your procrastination, right? You want to you wanna, you wanna self-improve. You want to get better. Maybe it's exercise. Maybe it's learning a skill. Maybe it's career progression, doing something in your business. But you keep putting it off. You keep procrastinating. That becomes permanent as well, right? The consistency of wasting money on vain things, right, rather than saving money. Right, it's so easy to just, I buy this, I buy it. Every time I go to the, every time I go fill up fuel, I buy the $5 packet of chips and the $5 Coke. And then it's just like, you're just constantly wasting this money and wasting this money and it becomes a permanent habit. And how much money have you thrown away? And this is why bad habits are bad as well. You know, you know when we talk about smoking, how much people spend on smoking. It's crazy, right? But these become permanent because it's the power of consistent and the, just the consistent practice of these bad habits. Right? So the opposite is also true. That's the warning this morning as we talk about consistently. Yes, it can work for you if you put these daily actions in towards your goal. But if you don't, right, the consistent bad things that you do become permanent. Proverbs 6 verse 6. Look at this. Go to the ant, thou sluggard. Now you think about ants, how persistent are they? You know, it's so hard to get them out of your house. You know? <laughs> they just keep coming, right? <laughs> Go to the ant, thou sluggard, consider her ways and be wise, which having no guide, overseer or ruler, provideth her meat in the summer and gathereth her food in the harvest. How long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? When wilt thou rise out of thy sleep? Look at this. Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep, so shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth, and thy wants as an armed man. You see, there's that opposite. So we, we want consistency to work in our favor and put those good habits in. You know, just put those small good habits and be disciplined and just daily just try and do them. Yeah, you're going to fail sometimes. But at least if you've set some daily things that you do towards your goal, then you know you're on track, right? And you can do these daily things. And if you don't, the opposite is true. See, the sluggard doesn't become poor and waste their life just overnight. 
You see how it's the, the daily just putting it off and you know it's the little sleep, the little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth and thy want as an armed man. And oftentimes, you know, it's not just, you know, overnight people just are on the street. You know, it's a, it's a daily sort of slow descend there, you know, or not putting things away like the ant, right? So that when winter comes, they have actually something to fall back, back on. But you can see when somebody just loses it all and they're on the street, you know, the question is, you know, that, that was a buildup to that happening. It doesn't just happen overnight, even though the eventual fall may happen very quickly. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is, just in conclusion, you know, we're talking about consistency. We talked about, you know, the power of it in terms of affecting positive change and the danger of us not doing anything about it and consistently doing the bad things and having that negative change in, in our life. Just in the context of what is happening today, I just want to share these thoughts with you. You know, we look at our society the way it is today and, you know, it's, it's very left-leaning. You know, we think about, you know, all the, the lockdowns that are happening now. And what you need to realize is this didn't happen overnight, right? The reason why our country is the way it is right now is because we are like on the tail end of generations dropping the ball and we are where we are today. Right? So don't think that this just happened in one generation or just happened in one you know, government term that all of a sudden we are where we are. Right? This has happened over probably decades now and many generations. So why I think this is a good thing to reflect on is because I think what is happening in our country right now has woken a lot of people up to say, man, we better get in this fight and we better do something so that it doesn't descend further. And what I want to say this morning to encourage you is like it doesn't take one government term or one generation for it to get to where we are now, it's not going to take one generation to turn it around, right? So don't lose heart. We just need to start writing this ship into the right direction. You know, maybe we won't see it in our lifetime. A lot of the things we fight for in our life may not be seen in our lifetime, but somebody's got to start it. Right? Otherwise, it'll never change. So we don't want to lose heart, but it's going to require some diligence. It's going to require some extra work from us to make the changes in this society. So what we need to think about today is we can't just be the same as we've always been if we're going to be fighting against gravity. You know, I always talk about it you know, like, like you're standing on that escalator. Right? You know, when you're a kid and you go up the wrong way, Right? If you just stand still, what happens? You start going backwards. Right? So we have to make sure we're constantly moving because you know, if God's people aren't moving forward, we can't expect the world to make the changes if we are the salt and light in this world. So I thought this was a good verse to end on. Isn't this interesting? The hand of the diligent shall bear rule, but the slothful shall be under tribute. So you think, why are we in this situation where we are the oppressed? It's because our enemies have been a lot more diligent and consistent than we have, right? And in order for us to take this country back or to make a change, it's going to require change from us, right? You, 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 you know, we've got, we got to stop looking at change coming from afar. It's got to start at the house of God. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Uh, Lord, it's... You know, it's such a hard thing to do, Lord, and this is why I preached this this morning because uh, I wanted that reminder myself as well, Lord, that, you know, taking these little steps and being disciplined in just being consistent. Uh, Lord, help us, Lord, to have that discipline. Uh, I know it's so much harder than, than, it, than it is to say, uh, but Lord, if we can take those little steps daily and just do that little bit extra every day, precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little there a little, Lord, we can make huge changes over time. So we pray, Lord, that you help us, help us to be disciplined in our spiritual life, help us to grow, and uh, pray, Lord, that you'll use us to make a difference in this world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.